I'm really excited today. Might not be able to tell. I always try to channel you. You guys ever watch UHF, Weird Al's movie? It's a vastly underrated movie. Uh, the guy, the, the pet store guy, where he's, got, he's like, we're going to teach poodles how to fly. Not that, because that's terrible. But his happiness. I always try to channel his happiness. Keeps me from going to my dark places. But wait, no, this is, this is, this is a time for joy. Uh, this is the X399 Designare EX from Gigabyte. This is the first Threadripper motherboard. Actually, this is the first motherboard in a long time. The uh, gaming, not part of the title. I'm liking that already. I don't know if there's anything wrong. I mean, everybody likes the game. I like the game. I get <laughs> serious business and also, you know, gaming, it's fun. Staves off the insanity, that's for sure, in the dark places. So, you know, <laughs> it could be worse. Uh, let's take a look at this motherboard and see what sets it apart because you look at it and you look at the box and you look at the features and it's like, well, it's pretty similar to the uh, Aorus Gaming 7. So what did they do different? Let's take a look. Got some Velcro straps in the box. Now this, now this is some, some next level stuff right here. Like the, the next Andy Warhol. I want to know who, uh, I want to know who designed this logo, this like goat man glasses logo because that's definitely my spirit animal. I mean, you can you can definitely tell. His collar is kind of wrinkly, but he's wearing the tie, so you know he's dressed up in spirit. But um, he's not he's not really buying into it, and he's wearing a vest because, you know, it's vest is cheaper and easier to maintain than a jacket. I think I'd probably rather have a vest than a suit jacket, but I usually opt for the suit jacket just because it's the easy button solution. We got kind of the I mean, I don't know these stickers. These stickers are next level. And of course, you got the cable labels as well, but. I mean, this, <laughs> where is this artist's Etsy store? I want to know, I want to, uh, I need some prints. <laughs> it's nice. All right, what is this? To avoid a blue screen after the Wi-Fi module driver is installed in the Windows 10 SR2, refer to the following instructions, yes. So this was a thing that happened to a lot of Threadripper people, ironically or unironically. You got the Intel drivers. Oh, the Intel drivers make certain assumptions about your hardware and blue screen. This was an issue that I had on several boards. So do pay attention to this because the built-in Wi-Fi uh, on a fresh installation of Windows can eat your lunch. So pay attention to the insert. That is important. Feels a little bit like opening the Ark of the Covenant. It's like, oh my gosh, but hopefully without the uh, face melting effects. Cool, so we've got driver CD, remote uh, temperature sensors, so that you can uh, put these temperature sensors on other peripherals, like say your graphics card or whatever, and read them. Ooh, that's nice. Sort of a brushed metallic designator case badge. Multilingual installation guide. Got our high speed bridge. I'm liking that, look how far away those are. Those cards will have plenty of room to breathe even if they're a three slot card. Is there an M.2 to U.2 adapter? In case anybody out there is rocking the U.2 drives. I'm hoping those Intel, uh, I'm hoping those Intel U.2 drives uh, show up on eBay sooner or later real cheap. Kind of like the IO Drive 2s, because uh, the IO Drive 2s are nice. There's no controllers, so you gotta use software. It's kind of a pain. But, you know, the Intel ones will be okay. Looks like we've got six braided cloth, braided six gigabit per second SATA cables. Gigabyte G connector. This makes hooking up your front panel a lot easier in your case. Some RGB header extensions. This is the RGBW header strips and also looks like the digital LED strip headers. So even in the non-gaming world, we don't escape RGB. Ah, that's all right. I'm, I'm softening to RGB. Then we've got some M.2 mounting accessories. Got our Torx wrench for our Threadripper socket. Yes. Now this is how you do a Wi-Fi antenna. Look at that, it's on a nice long cable. It connects at the back of the machine. You can reposition the antenna anywhere you want. This is how you do a wireless antenna. Favorite part of a new motherboard? This, 
is the poodles out the window part. It's glorious. So check it out. There are quite a few similarities to the Gaming 7 in terms of layout. Namely, we've got the same 8-pin plus 4-pin power input. We've got a similar M.2 layout. We've got the three M.2s, the two 110-millimeter M.2 and the 80-millimeter uh, M.2. Now, this one would be an ideal one for putting your U.2 adapter or something like that because it's way out of the way of all of your expansion slots. Um, we've got the 8 and 6 gigabit per second SATA ports. We've got our USB-C header. Now, this header seems to be labeled for a Thunderbolt add-in card. 2018, the Thunderbolt standard supposedly is going to be opened up by Intel. So I'm thinking add-in Thunderbolt adapter card at a later date, at least it looks like to me, to my naked eye, I have no inside information that maybe that's what's being prepared here. Now, of course I asked and uh, you know, things get lost in the cracks and uh, no real direct answer on, on what's going on with that. But with Intel theoretically opening what's left, I mean, Thunderbolt is mostly open already. There's just a few little things, especially around Thunderbolt 3. I'm hoping that Intel will release it punitively. I could see them maybe not wanting to do that because, you know, some manager somewhere is like, why would we help our competition? That would, why, would we, why would we do that? Instead of trying to make the world a better place for everybody. There's not many people that have that attitude anymore. I'm one of the few I've discovered. It's just like, no, it's like everybody is just so like self-focused, self-centered, whatever. It's like, no, let's just make the world a better place. And, you know, we'll sort out who gets five bucks and who gets seven bucks later. Let's just make everything better. I mean, come on. It's like, this is the philosophy episode of the Motherboard channel, so I don't know. May have had too many M&Ms today, it's hard to say. We've got our eight DDR4 DIMM slots. Now, official support from Gigabyte is up to 2667 because, hey, the memory controller on Threadripper and Ryzen, it's a little more server-oriented, so it's a little more conservative. However, was able to run quad channel 32 gigs at DDR4 3200. Now, the more memory that you use and the higher density memory that you use generally, the speed uh, will not be quite as good. So the motherboard for me supported DDR4 3200. This is an evolving platform. I mean, you can add up to 128 gigabytes of memory to the motherboard with the memory that is available today. But for future memory kits, it should support even higher memory densities as those kits become available on the market. Before I continue to ramble endlessly, uh, let's talk about our motherboard connectors. We've got our 8-pin CPU power plus our 4-pin CPU power for supplemental CPU power. The 4-pin is optional, but if you're planning to run an overclock, especially like a 4.0, 4.1, 4.2 gigahertz overclock all the time, definitely do add that supplemental power. Uh, then you can see that we've got our heat pipe running between them for our two voltage regulation banks, and these are really uh, serious voltage regulation heat sinks. This is international rectifier for the voltage and power delivery system. You know, Threadripper on paper, up to 180 watts. If you're pushing it with an overclock in terms of like continuous draw and things like that, it can approach 300, 350 watts with maybe an extreme overclock. Um, the good news is Threadripper really, especially in comparison to the competition, doesn't really use as much power. It's much more power efficient. So I don't think that you would really need to push an overclock that much. I think most people would be perfectly fine with 250 watts, um, you know, through the connector. And this eight pin power connector, absolute maximum before the wires get hot and things get weird. It's like 375, 400 watts, something like that. So coming around the top here, we've got two four pin fan headers and then another three four pin fan headers at the front edge of the motherboard. So for cases that have a lot of top and front cooling, I fig uh, figure that should uh, fix you up. Coming down the front edge of the motherboard, we've got our 24 pin ATX power connector, USB 3.1 Gen 2, the protocol, so 10 gigabit per second. We've got our Thunderbolt connector I was mentioning before, eight six gigabit per second SATA ports. Got our, our 80 millimeter M.2 and our front panel connector. Got our diagnostic code readout LED bank, a USB 3.0 Gen 1, that's five gigabit per second front panel connector, two more four pin fan connectors, two USB 2.0 headers, a physical power switch, reset switch, and a CMOS clear switch. Our TPM header, our RGBW LED connector, our digital LED header connector, and then our front panel audio connector. Now we've got a mix of the uh, WIMA, uh, the red, you know, high-end audio capacitors and our other audio grade audio capacitors. It is on an isolated part of the PCB. It is based on a Realtek ALC 1220, 100 dB signal to noise ratio. It does have the amp up audio. It does have support for Sound Blaster X 720 degrees, um, you know, audio features. So you get that if that's something you're looking for. Now one significant upgrade 
or this motherboard is that you do actually have active cooling included with the motherboard on the VRM. There's a tiny fan that you can't even see. Don't know how I would get a camera in there, but it's connected at the uh, four pin fan header, just you know, right next to the regulator, just behind the RAM. And uh, it exhausts air out the uh, back of the machine through the, the IO panel. So nicely done, Gigabyte. Now let's talk about our rear panel I.O. Now if you'll notice, there's no rear panel I.O. shield included in the box, but that's because it's built into the motherboard. You don't have to worry about it with this motherboard. You don't have to forget about installing it and then have to remove your motherboard and reinstall it later. At the rear I.O. panel, we've got one combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port. If you would like to use both a mouse and keyboard that are PS2, there are Y cables that will do that. And they use different pins in the PS2 connector, so it's not like you're sharing resources or anything. We've got our two gigabyte uh, amp up audio ports. If you're not familiar with that feature on Gigabyte motherboards, those two USB ports have a separate power delivery system for USB audio DACs so that USB audio DACs get clean power. The idea is that the sound gets converted from digital to analog outside the relatively noisy uh, environment, at least speaking electromagnetically, inside your case. So then we've got uh, eight more USB 3 ports. Now, two of them are USB 3.1 Gen 2, 10 gigabit per second, one type A and one type C. That's provided by an AS Media controller that has the PCI Express 3.0 by 2 interface. And the others are USB 3.1 Gen 1, that's a 5 gigabit per second. One of them, the colored white one, will let you flash the BIOS on this motherboard uh, in the future should you want to add you know, maybe you pick up one of these and it, you've got a new version of the Threadripper CPU and it's not really supported. Like uh, the 1900X came out, it was an eight core CPU. Took everybody a little bit by surprise. The motherboards that were on shelves maybe don't support the 1900X. You could use the BIOS flash port to upgrade your BIOS on your motherboard even before uh, it's in a situation where it would post so that you can um, run CPUs that are newer. Because uh, unlike competing platforms, this socket is gonna be here for a while. So, you know, eight months from now, it's not going to be like, oh, throw that socket away. We've got a totally new Threadripper socket. That is, AMD's not going to do that. So uh, I would expect at least one more, maybe two or three more generations of CPU for this socket. And if you happen to pick up this motherboard and a newer CPU, that's like, man, why won't it post with a newer CPU? You can upgrade your BIOS even without having a CPU installed in the motherboard at all. It's a completely independent system. So it's a nice feature. Then we've got our two Intel Gigabit NICs. Now I know what you're thinking. Wait, why is there no 10 Gigabit on this motherboard? Well, 10 Gigabit drives up the cost. Not everybody can use 10 gigabit because 10 gigabit is expensive, but if you want 10 gig, I've got 60 PCI Express lanes. I can just add a 10 gig adapter. Look, this is a dual 10 gig adapter they got on eBay from China for like $110. And so as uh, an older Intel adapter, these are not necessarily great. They get really hot. They need a lot of airflow, but yeah, I can just use that in any one of my five PCI Express by 16 slots. Although I probably wouldn't use it in the middle one. And we'll talk about why in a minute. I guess the minutes now. So yeah, we got five PCI Express by 16 slots. So here is the PCI Express layout by 16, by eight, by four through the chipset, by 16 and by eight. So we've got these two slots, which are always by 16. You can run your graphics cards in those and that's what the high speed bridge is included for. And then you've also got PCI Express by eight in both of these connectors. These slots, there's no PLX trickery, there's no PCI Express switching. These slots are wired directly into the CPU because we've got 60 lanes, 60 PCI Express lanes directly into the CPU through PCI Express on Threadripper, which is nuts, it's completely nuts. The other four PCI Express lanes are used by the chipset, which provides some additional PCI Express 2.0 connectivity. Uh, and that is through this slot here, which is actually useful. I mean, there are PCI Express peripherals on the market. Older Blackmagic Intensity Pro 4K capture cards, for example, will work much better in this PCI Express 2.0 slot than they do in PCI Express 3 slots. So at least that's been my own personal experience. The cards are way more stable when you do that. Uh, things like the IO Drive 2, that's actually technically a PCI Express by 2.0 by 8, probably would use that in the PCI Express 2.0 slot, if I, especially if I had problems with it. Although you could run it in the PCI Express 3.0 and still have the by 8 interface. It'll drop down to PCI Express 2.0, but it's useful to have that PCI Express 2.0 interface for diagnostic and testing purposes. Um, now in some UEFIs you can change the link speed, so you know keep that in mind. And then of course all three of our M.2 slots are wired directly into the CPU. No bottleneck. So the NVMe RAID situation 
is by far a superior situation than on any other uh, competing platform at this time, especially in terms of M.2 integrated into the motherboard. On competing platforms, you can uh, do some trickery to have the M.2 run through a PCI Express add-in card, but eh, you, you use your, uh, there's just, I don't know, things, things get kind of weird. These three M.2s are directly into the CPU, which is the ideal situation. For those of you that are keeping track of, you know, Lotz versus Foxconn, this motherboard does have a Foxconn TR4 socket for Threadripper. I know that some people uh, are, <laughs> a preference is emerging on the internet, if you will, uh, for the Lotz Threadripper socket because it's a little easier to deal with. It's a little easier to install your CPU. Some people have trouble with threading on their Foxconn socket, so we're gonna put that to the test. We'll install a CPU and see how that goes. But by and large, I don't really think that's too serious of an issue. Also included in the software bundle on this motherboard is a 12 month license for XSplit Gamecaster. I personally use Open Broadcaster, but hey, if you want to use XSplit, XSplit's commercial software does similar stuff, maybe has some more features. Uh, yeah, you get a 12 month license with that bundled with the motherboard. So it's a nice touch in terms of the, uh, in terms of the software bundle. So what's the final verdict on this motherboard? Well, uh, as far as I can tell, the power delivery system is as advertised, which is Gigabyte is basically saying, look, we, our server boards and server components, we're basically dumping that into this motherboard. International rectifier, upgraded chokes and coils, even upgraded a little bit over the Gaming 7 is what we've delivered on this motherboard. We're also providing active cooling for our VRM because even just a little bit, even just blowing over the VRM will dramatically alter the temperature. Because you know, even though it's it's 85 to 95 percent efficient, depending on the specific components and some other conditions on the motherboard, you know that's if you've got 200 watts, 250 watts, 300 watts, that's still you know 25, 35 watts of heat, and so you need at least a little bit of airflow to uh, remove that heat production. And Gigabyte has added a teeny tiny little fan on the inside to, to do that. I don't think that'll really be an issue for most people, and you should definitely have cooling in the front and top of your case, especially if you've got an all-in-one cooler, just so you've got a little bit of airflow over the motherboard. It'll really help you in terms of longevity and your components and that sort of thing. So yeah, this is this is nice for a uh, non-gaming motherboard. I mean, the aesthetic might not be your cup of tea, but I kind of like it. It's, it's sort of it's sort of futuristic and uh, you know, it's kind of functional. The, the M.2 covers, they're optional. You don't have to use them, but they are pretty significant um, chunks of aluminum. So unless your, your, your workload is very right heavy, these heat sinks will function as intended um, and help uh, remove the heat from your M.2 and dissipate it into the case. Now, if your M.2 is riding 99% of the time, uh, you may have a little bit of a heat soaking issue and you would just be better off having more airflow in the area. I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, this is perfectly fine for 99% of people, so. Um, overall, I think the Gigabyte has done a really good job with this motherboard for Threadripper, um, and time will tell how it's, you know, how it is in terms of uh, stability and the platform and things like that. Because Threadripper as a platform still has some minor teething issues, but uh, I think this is a motherboard that is going to be around for a while. I wouldn't be too surprised if we see a Rev 2 uh, of this motherboard in, in you know, eight to twelve months uh, if uh, AMD comes out with a refresh of their, their TR4 processors or, or some kind of a minor update, or it may just be a quiet, a quiet refresh or a quiet update um, just to help smooth out some of the wrinkles on the uh, Threadripper platform. All in all though, Threadripper platform, it's really, it's really where the value is at if your workload can use a lot of cores. So really, really impressed with this motherboard. Nice job, Gigabyte. It's definitely worth a close look to see if it'll fit your application and fit what you're you know, trying to build if you're considering this motherboard. Uh, the uh, the commercial industry may be you know may be driving some of these things after all. I like big budgets and I cannot lie. <laughs> I'm Wendell. I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.